guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. Before I jump into the questions from last week's videos, I wanted to talk quick about Proven Winners Grand Garden Show that Aaron and I will be attending this next August. It's the 28th through the 31st. A lot of people go for the first two days. That's when a lot of the activity happens. Russell, stay away from my drink. And then there are things going on though on the 30th and 31st as well, so you kind of pick and choose a little bit. Uh, anyway, I received word this morning that with the way ticket sales are going, they're expected to sell out fairly quickly, like probably by the first of April so if it's something you're thinking about definitely you know jump on it sooner rather than later yeah. uh, so I just wanted to say that uh, there was also questions about me being listed on the website as a keynote speaker after I said I will I will go but I will not speak <laughs> um, so I'm not like a keynote speaker but I think Jenny and I because Jenny from Creekside Nursery is going to be there as well I think we're going to do something kind of together um, so I'm not going to be presenting by myself because I don't think I'll ever do that again in my life yeah because I don't want to. Well, you so. can do some type of a Q&A. We, so, we don't have it planned. No. We'll be there, but we have what, no idea what, what you're we'll doing, doing there. Either way, if you want to come and say hi, we'll be there to say hi to anybody that wants to yeah, yeah. chat. And that's, that's the most fun part for me anyway. I wonder, you know, some of the gardens that Jack put together, you know, were new the last time we were there. Mm -hmm. And they've had a chance. I mean, this is going to be like, you know, two years later. Right. It'll be interesting to see how some of them have changed. Yeah. Also, I think that we're going to try to get there early this time because we always have... Okay, getting to Mackinac is not easy for anybody. Well... Well, unless you happen to live, like, within an hour. Right. But we have to take three plane rides and a ferry ride and a taxi ride and then a carriage ride. Mm-hmm. So we're going to try to get there earlier because it takes us all day. We have to wake up. When do we wake up? 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, and then we usually get there right after dinner time or yeah. right at dinner time. I remember rushing to get changed so that we could. And dinner was already had already started and they yeah. just had saved us a couple of spots. And so we. And the last time in. that we went, what did it take us? Like two and a half days to get there yeah. because of delays. Yeah. So we're going to try to maybe go a couple days early this time. It'd be nice. Anyway, let's just get into the videos now. The first one was looking at 20 great seed starting setups. So we asked for your guys' contribution um, to just send in pictures of what your seed starting setup looks like, what has worked well for you, what lights you like, what shelves you like, what kind of seeds you start, and so on and so forth. We got a lot of fun submissions. So we went over 20 of them in this video. And they were, I think they were really fun because they ranged in both space that they take up and budget that they take up. I mean, all the way from winter sowing in Ziploc bags, not even like plastic container, like plastic jugs, mm -hmm. um, Ziploc bags all the way up to, you know, like bamboo LED grow light gardens, which are probably like high end top end mm -hmm. on the grow light setup spectrum mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway so i thought that it really served or i guess served as inspiration for any of us you know at whatever stage we're at in the seed starting game so anyway thank you to all of you who sent stuff in that was just amazing uh first comment was from the plantastic nerd gosh people are so creative and inventive yes they are one can only be inspired by all these amazing setups thank you laura for showing them to us and thank you to everyone who submitted them time to start organizing my seeds for spring so excited and i think that's what it is all of these videos we've been kind of putting together of everybody's fun, beautiful things. It is inspiring. You know, there's not as much going on right now. We're all, a lot of us are in planning stage or organizing stage and it's motivating to mm -hmm. me to see those things. And I'm like, okay, I need to get with it. I need to start designing this space. Or I need to start like, thinking about these containers and what I should put in them based on what that person did, you know, and so on and so forth. <laughs> it's going to be my word this video, I guess. Uh, Maria said, is it okay to put the racks next to a window? Can too much light hurt the seed? I know. Mm -mm. I think the more light, the better. I mean, if it's like a south facing or a full afternoon sun facing, you do want to make sure that you are mindful of both heat and uh, mindful that they don't dry out because they'll dry out a lot quicker the more light and heat that they get, of course. So that as long as they're getting plenty of moisture, I think you're, you're good. Laura said, how high should the seedlings be when you start putting a fan on them? I put a fan on them pretty much right away. Like, um, I, you'll see this probably, I don't know, before or after this recap, but I did a seedling tour just showing you how everything's doing in here. And I have some that are just barely up and I have a fan going on them right now uh, because I feel like it's so important from the gate to not ha let them become stringy and leggy and all of those sorts of things. We want them to be strong right away. But again, once you start the fan and have your humidity domes off, they dry out a lot quicker. So you just have to check them more often. I check mine twice a day. So I check them sometime in the morning and then I come back out here like late at night, 10, 30, 
2011 or whatever and I just give everything a cursory glance I usually have to water like a cell or two but I don't want to come here in the, the next morning and see this little withered up seedling and it, you know all it needed was a little bit of water for me yeah. so I watch things fairly closely things kind of my lisianthus dried out a little bit there for a minute hopefully they look okay so hopefully we're we're okay on those things happen still Malia has said, I have a question that is not related to the video, but watching your latest post on Facebook, I noticed a birch tree there that I didn't before. I plan to have six birch trees near my house and I hear different things about it. I wonder, is it okay to have them near a house? And also, is it true that they are smaller when planted near each other or that nothing can grow underneath? Can you do a video on what trees are best to plant near a house for shade if you haven't already? So we do have birch trees uh, decently close to our house. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wanna make sure that they're not so close that they're going to inter interfere with any kind of foundation or things like that. And birch trees, they're not like willows, but they still have roots that want to search for water. So it's something that, you know, you probably want to be a little bit mindful of. Ours are probably 20 feet away from the house. Well, they're, at least. put it this way, they're close enough that I have to trim branches to not touch the roof. Right. So they, but the trunk, I want to yeah, say the from the corner is, of the house is probably 20 feet out. Yeah, Maybe yeah, a little. 20 is probably good. 20 ish feet. Yeah which their spread is probably 20 to 25 feet. So you have to imagine their root system underneath might go as wide as their canopy, maybe maybe a tiny touch wider. Um, so just kind of plan on that. But I think that would be an interesting video to put together. I think that's a really good idea. You know, how uh, trees near houses, yeah. things that won't mess with foundations. I, get, I see that question quite often. Things can grow underneath your birch trees though. That's a myth. I don't know, I haven't heard that before, but I have lots of things growing underneath our birch trees and they do fantastic. And I love birch trees. We've planted, let's see, just four so far on the new property. And I kind of want to put, I, I like to plant them in clumps and they do kind of stay a little bit smaller when you plant them really close together like that because they, they kind of speak to each other. Like they grow with light and air requirements to where they're not usually impeding each other too badly. Um, Amy said, so interesting seeing other setups. Just wondering what the differences are in grow lights. Is full spectrum lights all you need to look for? That's all I really care about. Both of mine are full spectrum, but one has the ability to use the colors white, pink, and blue separately. I have research, but it gets very complicated. It does, and I try to stay out of the weeds on that because I'm so not a professional. I do know what is it in the spectrum that plants use a lot of red and blue light. And so some people, depending on the stage of growth, like if you're growing something specific, I know like a lot of cannabis growers that they'll be very specific about the color of light they use at a specific growth stage because, you know, red light and blue light and whatever will uh, pr produce different results, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like, and what based on what I've read is that they do use red and blue a lot, but they also need other colors in the spectrum in order to uh, have like the best, I don't know, overall growth. I but remember researching it at one point and I think the conclusion that I came to was that if you're just a hobbyist it doesn't matter just get some full spectrum lights yeah. and only if you get to the point where you know say like you said you're like a you know like you're growing a specific large scale crop or... whatever grower mm -hmm. you know then at that point it might matter for the specific crop that you're growing and if it's same that bud stage or flower too. stage or whatever yeah you know. i feel like it's the same with fertilizing if you're mm -hmm. just a hobbyist you can throw like an all-purpose fertilizer yeah. on almost anything mm -hmm. and it'll help yeah but if you're getting real into the weeds like you're growing one crop and you're you know, wanting to be very specific about it, which is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really want to do all that research, we have too many things going on. All of my lights are full spectrum LED, high efficiency, like output, high output lights. So mine are the ones you don't have to raise and lower, which has been kind of a game changer for me. Um, I got all of mine from Gardner Supply, but there's other ones out there that are really good too, that you guys showed in the video. Uh, Karen said, would your sister think of starting a cooking channel? As I've heard you mention that she's a good, uh, that she's a good cook before. I don't know that she'd ever do a channel. She enjoys the heck out of it, though. She loves to cook. It's yeah. her jam. Like The thing about starting a channel is that it, it's so different than um, than actually doing the It changes the, the game. It, yeah, it changes it the game. Mm -hmm. Like, don't you think in, in a lot of ways, there's so many things that you do that are not gardening? Yeah. You know, you kind of look like a gardener, but at the same time... Well, a lot of times when I'm vlogging by myself, like the African Violet video recently, I had four cameras I had four cameras going and I manned every single one of them like I was in here by myself because you were busy doing mm -hmm. something else and I really wanted to get some good shots and I did 
okay. <laughs> um, but like I had to, so I was standing here talking to you guys about what I was doing and then I'd have to go check a camera quick and then I'm like, I can't remember where I was at. Dang it, I need to do that whole take again because I can't remember, you know, and of course I could scrub back but it just takes longer to yeah. go through footage. And what was so, I doing? I don't remember what you were was doing. Was I meeting with someone or something? <sighs> I don't remember. Hmm. I don't, but you had something going on and I wanted to do that project, so yeah. So yeah, it does change it a lot because I am not the one who's really interested so much in the videography part of it. Mm -hmm. I can do it, you know, enough to get a video If you start a, a channel or like a blog or something, you know, let's say you start a cooking blog, you have to become a writer, you know, yeah. and your spelling matters all of a sudden. And, <laughs> and, your, and your, the way you structure sentences. Yeah. And, and when if you, you can write in a grouping way. And when you uh, way. start a YouTube channel, you have to learn how to edit. Or you need to rely on somebody else. If you don't have somebody else that can do the editing and mm -hmm. videography part of it, there's yeah. a lot to it. There really is. And it does change it quite a bit because it's not just like getting in the kitchen and cooking or getting out in the garden and doing something. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different it's a whole well, different Well, then you get thing. into whole like SEO, um, like optimizing your titles and optimizing your thumbnails for what, the, and that's a lot of stuff that we don't really get into. I, I dabble in it slightly, mm -hmm. but. Also, you have to all of a sudden think about lighting and you have to think yeah. about how can, how can you guys who are watching this see it the best? So I've designed so many things from back behind to where I'm hoping it looks good from the front. But like, I wouldn't do that on a normal basis. Like if I'm just outside doing my own thing or making a flower arrangement on my own, not filming it, of course it's facing toward me. Yeah. You know, I'm not doing that just for fun, right. you know, from back behind. I'm doing it so you guys can see it better. And so there's just a whole different uh, thing you have to think about. It does change it and you have to have like, thankfully I have like massive passion for gardening and plants and all that sort of thing. And really for the community that we have built that, um, I don't know, it doesn't feel like a like chore work. or work. Yeah. yeah. And I think that it could have the potential to maybe ruin somebody's hobby mm -hmm. and make it not as fun. Yeah. I mean, there well, are days for me too. I think like that's everyone. what has been so good about the strengths that you and I have is that I think we filled in most of those holes between the two of us. Yeah. I think that, I mean, like it just, it wouldn't even be close to possible with me by myself because especially gardening, <laughs> that's well, not what I'm into. But like, I don't think you would have been able to take anything off the ground either because oh, you no. wouldn't have wanted to get in front of a camera. No. You wouldn't have ever dreamed of trying to edit a video no. or buy a camera or any of that stuff. Huh. So I think that it didn't ruin it for us because it we, takes multiple people. <laughs> yeah, we filled in all the yeah. gaps mm -hmm. between our what we like to do. I've told her she should do it before. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'd be able to hopefully be helpful yeah. in that uh, arena, but it would take a lot. She works full time too. So, C. Venza said, "How do grow lights affect the organic or naturalness of the plant?" Well, grow lights just enable us to get things started early enough because some of us don't have a long enough season um, to get those really warm season crop, like eggplants. We can't plant them from a seed in the ground and really expect much by the end of the season. Maybe, maybe, um, but it would be pushing it. And so if we can start those things early and have them grown on once it's warm enough for them to actually survive, then you know it enables us to grow things that we wouldn't normally be able to. As far as like affecting the natural, I mean, it's just throwing off the natural rhythm, I guess, of how you're growing your plant. Um, but it, the end result of the plant is still organic. Yeah. Just because you're providing alternative light or non-natural light. Well, in terms of like swapping or switching from your grow light situation out to the outside, it is a little bit more intense out there. So, I mean, because there's a lot, of more, a lot more environmental factors going on in terms of wind and all of that. Um, so there's a gradual harding, hardening off process in order to get your seedling from inside a little bit more tender conditions uh, toughened up in order to stand withstand outside. Because our grow lights are nothing like our sun out in the summertime. Like if I put a plant straight from a grow light, even though it's getting strong light in here enough to grow, I put it out there in an hour, it would be fried in the summertime because mm -hmm. it's not used to the high temperature and the wind and all of that. So I have no idea if that's what you were looking for <laughs> in terms of an answer, but there you go. Um, Noah Bass uh, said, hey, I have a question. Can I submit photos if I don't live in the US or places where you can look up the garden zone? Absolutely. I live in Spain and have tried to find my garden zone and obviously there isn't anything. I see all the submissions are of US. You know, you could just submit what your lowest like average wintertime temperature is in Celsius, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we could kind of figure out. You know what, I'll change it. the form next time. Okay. Um, I, I made the zone a required field so that people wouldn't skip it. Oh. 
but I wasn't I wasn't trying to exclude anybody that sure. was outside the US. Uh-huh. I just didn't I didn't want people to see that and be like, "Oh, it's not required. I just won't write anything." Right. So I wanted them to write something there. Oh, I didn't know it was required. So, you know, Sorry if, about that. If people just write if you just wrote Spain, that's good enough like if if we just yeah, know that's... where you're at cuz people kind of generally know like if you I say I don't know I live what, in, what the temperature because well, it, it's a decent sized country like it is it, but like if you say I live in Sweden mm-hmm. I, in mentally I'm gonna say okay that's probably gonna be similar to like um, you know part of Canada you know in terms of like latitude or longitude they're gonna be like on the same plane as maybe like northern flatitude, northern Canada right latitude's flatitude and long longitude is long right is that what it is? so latitude yeah yeah. It's the same. I think Actually, including okay, a, now a, I need to look it up because what if I'm like really wrong about that about Sweden? You, you might be. I, when you were saying that, I'm like someone's gonna call you out. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, maybe including a low temperature, like an average low wintertime temperature, we can assign a zone to that pretty easy. I need to look up where Sweden <laughs> is on the latitude. Hold on. <gasps> so what did we determine after you spilled your drink all over the floor? <laughs> we determined that. It it's is. Like it's definitely northern, northern Canada. Canada. So there you go. Now we know. Next video was full garden center house plant tour. So we went down there uh, when they were closed, which was really nice. And we just toured you around because I had been down there recently to help receive the order, the big load of plants and help get them out and priced and all that sort of thing. Uh, so it was nice just to see everything done uh, because we didn't finish the day that I went down to help. They finished in the days following that. Uh, and it looked really pretty and full. And I just love it when there's brand new plants down there. So 208 Bonstrom said you two are the best at giving house plant tours naming each one giving us a nice close-up view of each describing the plant features and your genuine enthusiasm it feeds my plant lover soul thank you well thank you for such a sweet comment and you know i actually felt way more confident in naming the plant names just because when i helped receive the order like i'm opening up boxes full of these plants and we're having to check them off a list and so it kind of refreshes my memory i've dealt with a lot of those plants throughout the years but i don't remember all of the names i mean is it possible to there's new ones coming out all the time too and um so it was a really good refresher course for me just to re-familiarize myself with some of those. I had to take a nap after this plant tour. <laughs> I don't blame you. Holy cow, that's a lot of plants. How long does it take for those massive aloe plants to grow? Ooh, I don't know how old those are actually. They are, they are stunning. That's what you said, and they are. I would love to see Aaron's face every time you say, I think I need to take one of these home. <laughs> Your face is pretty much like, sure. Can you put together a care guide on that one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, n- now, it's how we make money, so it's like... I don't get much resistance from Aaron. Yeah, on you, you pretty much have to have plants to, to plant in the ground, to show in videos. I and, think I resist more than you do. Because you're like, let's get on ordering trees. We need big trees, we need yeah, evergreens. Right. I'm like, uh, oh, hang on, I still have to think about the area around. I think what it is is the types of plants that I want and the types of plants that you want are different. Because I don't think... I focus on cut flower garden hard. Yeah. like seeds and yeah. I that is the area where I feel like freedom and I feel like I don't know like just I can do whatever I want not that I can't do whatever I want in the rest of my garden but it's more structured mm-hmm. and I do like a structured garden so I mean in the end that's the look I want but in the cut flower garden I can experiment with whatever I want to experiment with yeah and that's fun to me to try out new stuff even if it doesn't work or you know you learn a lot that way I think if I could plant everything, like whatever I wanted and Uh just what I wanted and Uh there was no one else, I think it would be mostly trees and and large shrubs, things that don't take a lot of maintenance. Uh I really appreciate annuals. Mm -hmm. I think like perennials don't really do it for me so much, um, but annuals do. And I don't want to plant them myself, but I really appreciate the work that it takes to make it look pretty. Mm -hmm. So whenever we go somewhere and I see a lot of annuals, I... I know how much work goes into it, mm-hmm. and so like there's an appreciation yeah. there, and I like the look. Yeah. I just wouldn't want to do it myself. I think we did a pretty good job getting a lot of trees planted on the in the South Garden this mm-hmm. last year. I feel like we made a pretty good dent. I mean, you can only do so much right. in a certain amount of time and all of that business, so yeah. We have a lot more trees we need to plant, though. Yeah. You know, I was looking at my... I went out, and we did... My mom and I did some stuff out in her garden yesterday, and um, we had thought about maybe doing a winter winter garden tour out there, which we may still do that. Um, but to look at a 30 plus year old mature garden with huge evergreens and huge trees. And then I come home, I'm like, we've just had to lay waste to so much of our garden mm-hmm. because there were diseased trees and trees that were dropping big limbs and, and, or like they just needed 
like the privet hedging. It was super mature and huge, but it was super dead too. <laughs> like yeah. it was almost dead. And so we've had to start over in so many areas and we lost our big spruce tree, right. like stuff like that. And I, I mean, I know our garden will get that way. So I know sometimes like when I see those comments from people like, oh, I wish I had a space like this or this, you know, I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I get that. I get those yeah. feelings too. I go to an estate garden or go to a garden somewhere and see it in its full mature glory. And I'm like, oh, one day we'll mm -hmm. get there one day. Anyway, I don't know why that I've talked about that. Why? Why? Oh, because of the big trees. And, yeah. and I think that your approach is proper. Like you get your stuff in the ground that takes a long time to grow, like the big trees to get shade and evergreens. And you can worry about filling in the rest as you go. But mm -hmm. you'll thank yourself in five years that you planted that tree five years ago because yeah. of how much growth it actually has What's put on. What's that saying? The best time to plant a tree was last year or something like that? Or yeah. like best... Maybe it's like even 10 years ago. Yeah. Best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. Yeah. Any it's amount true. of time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas said, I work at a florist, which also has some house plants. Yesterday, while unwrapping a new big piece of the li lily plant, I saw a little frog nestled between some of the stems. Have you ever seen critters hiding? What's the weirdest you've seen? I don't think I've actually seen anything other than snails and slugs and aphids, spider mites on occasion. Um, occasionally, we'll get like one of those huge slugs that don't live here. Like, mm. what are they called? Are they like banana slugs? Is that what they call them? Mm. I don't even know. But they're massive. I actually stepped on one once when we were mm. on the coast. Anyway, huge, big, long Slug. slugs. Oh. Anyway, we t get those tossed pretty fast. They wouldn't, I don't know. They might survive in our climate. Not for long. We get the little itty bitty slugs occasionally around mm. our hostas and shady areas. It's weird to me, though, that they survive somehow. You know, you plant a hosta bed somewhere mm -hmm. and all around it can be pretty desolate but somehow the slugs like find their way to that hosta bed like are they just in the soil somewhere or i think they come in on plants sometimes and i think they're yeah they're they're here huh. just not in as huge of a presence as maybe some of you guys deal with uh trisha said what did you end up getting so i ended up getting a whole collection of peperomias i think i got every but single not that day not that day, no. You ended up going, uh, not because I remember we went back inside and you were like, oh, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna do it right now. Ref referring back to the had to take a nap after this plant yeah. tour, that's how I felt after the plant tour. I'm like, you know what? You changed your mind real quick when we walked back in the door. Yeah, I was gonna get stuff and I just was kind of like just done for the day. It was a Sunday that we, we filmed and we don't typically work on Sundays. My mom was watching the kids and so that we could be down there when they were closed, which was amazing, but I wanted to be with the kids too, so. Mm -hmm. We just kind of wrapped up as soon as we were done. But I did end up going back and getting mm -hmm. the whole tray of peperomias, a fern, two rex begonias, and um, two little hope philodendrons. I think that's all I've, I've picked out so far. It was quite a few, though, in the end. It was like 10 or 12 or something like that plants. It's a lot of new plants. Uh, Sarah said, when you, get, when you do get a shipment with a few plants with bugs, what do you do? Do you treat the affected plants or are they tossed? If tossed, does Andrews get any kind of compensation for that or does it, is it just a total loss for the store? You know, it depends on the company. But most of the time when we get loads, they're so local. The growers are so local that we inspect loads as we are taking them off typically. Like in this case, we couldn't because they were all boxed for the most part. Um, if something in this case came in with bugs that was boxed, uh, oftentimes we'll pull it from the, from the floor right away or it won't even make it to the floor. It'll go into a quarantine and then they get credit. Andrews gets credit. They don't have to pay for stuff that's buggy and they shouldn't. Um, the other stuff like annuals and perennials that we're lo loading off by flats, if we notice anything that's even undersized too, like I wouldn't ever accept something that wasn't filling the cup all the way. Like that's not retail ready. And sometimes growers would like try to slip a few of them in. And so we'd just send them back, just keep them on their rack and just send them right back to the grower and then they can deal with the bug problem and or the growing them on mm -hmm. problem. But very rare circumstance has a company been like, well, we'll give you a 50% discount. Like, huh, no way. Like, because when you get plants like that, then you have to use your chemical on it, whatever you're using, um, which costs money. You have to use your labor. You have to, uh, like, it's that much time that they're not on the floor with the ability to sell and to make money, space. you have to have space for it. There's just a lot of factors that... It really becomes just like a no-win scenario. Yeah, that's rare, though, that a company doesn't stand behind yeah. their plants. Well, like you said, they're all local, yeah. and they know that you're not going to keep buying from them if, right. if they send you buggy plants. Yeah. We had one company that still supplies a lot of the like box stores in our area, um, and he got so frustrated, the owner got so frustrated, because every week we were like, 
you're sending us plants full of spider mites or aphids. We're not going to take these. Like we're not, you know, in the in the spring when we're receiving annuals, those are in and out the door, mm -hmm. like fast. We don't mean to hold on to annuals for any length of time, especially to treat them for bugs. And finally he got so frustrated. He's like, I'm not sending stuff to you guys anymore. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well you can send that to the box stores and let them sell it. That's fine. <laughs> I yeah. hope that whoever's buying them sees it before they take it home. Uh, Jennifer said, I'm not sure if you've ever explained before, but how do you determine what the plant is? For example, there are all different kinds of Hoyas that look completely different. So what makes it a Hoya? Same for all the other ones. How do they look so different but come from the same family? <laughs> the tag. <laughs> for me, it's the tag. Yeah, like the one, that little, the Hoya with the tiny little, is it Curtisi or something, has a tiny little leaf. I wouldn't have thought it was a Hoya if I didn't know if it didn't have a tag. Mm -hmm. A lot of them you can, after a certain amount of time dealing with plants, you're like, okay, I think that that's in the Hoya family or that's a type. I mean, the peperomias are so vast mm -hmm. too. Like I would almost think that the one that was the more slender peperomia kind of looks like a Senecio to me. Mm -hmm. And so like I would have kind of wondered about that too. It's interesting. I. Yeah, we should um, we should gather a bunch of questions and uh, try to get a breeder. Yeah. To to ask a bunch of like breeder type questions, mm -hmm. like what makes things in the same family? But I mean, it's got to just be the genetics of the plant. Yeah. It's like well, part they're of the same they're working on like breeding different varieties together to get something new, and you yeah. never know what you're gonna get out of those. You can get like um, the what are they called? Not hostas. Hookeras. Yeah, hookeras, and you can get like tiarellas. Oh, hookerella. Hookera and Tiarella. So Hookerella is yeah, hookerella. a mix between a Hookera and a Tiarella. Yeah. So you get the colors from the Hookera and the shade tolerance from the Tiarella. But like, something. are they already in the same family to begin with? And so you can cross them because, because you can't like, you can't cross like a Supertunia and a tree. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're not going to get like a tree with, you know, Supertunia Super coming off blooms. of blooms. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so there'd be those kind of questions would be interesting. Like how far can you go when uh -huh. you're crossing species or right? You know, we should look into that. It. That would be really. I would be interested in that conversation. Yeah. You should host that, Aaron. Okay. Yeah, you you ask all the good questions. Um, L. Constantino said, want to purchase that fountain. Please advise. I'm thinking you're referring to the tall one with the leaves. That one sold to one of you guys. <laughs> it, I don't know where it was shipped to. Do you remember? No, I don't. But we really should have some type of like a disclaimer that says if you want something yeah i call. meant to say something but i never want you guys to feel like i'm trying to sell you anything that we're showing the videos like i just merely thought that you would enjoy they don't ship plants so like i wasn't trying to sell any of the plants um we just think it's interesting to show you kind of a different side of the garden and you know show you some of the behind the scenes at the garden center um but i know a lot of you guys contact and see stuff in the background or whatever that you're interested in which is really fun and i know my parents just enjoy the heck out of getting to know some of you guys and um anyway yeah so the, the fountain sold pretty quickly and i think they're going to order some more in so they probably won't put it on their website though you could call them um, talk to a gal named robin and she is very helpful in that department Orchestrated Madness said, split leaf philodendron, were they not monsteras? I don't know. Those are so similar to me. They said split leaf uh, philodendron. So I'm going with the tag, the tag on the plant because that's what the grower put in that pot. What was up with the monstera being so popular? I, I want to say it was maybe like a year ago or two it's years like ago. kind of like the fig, you know, the fiddle leaf, yeah. fiddle leaf fig. Like certain plants just... Take it looks off, like, like succulents were huge for a yeah. long time and they still i mean they all are there's they still are but not like they were mm -hmm. they kind of like everything goes in phases i think right. a little bit okay next video was potting succulent cuttings and rooting propagating african violets that was the video that i filmed all by myself <laughs> um i told aaron like I don't know. I think I got some good shots. We'll see. Hopefully the lighting was okay because there's actually a camera up above me and you can see we have it hooked to a TV. You can see the TV in the background so that when I'm doing stuff, I can glance over and I can see if I've got myself centered and all of that. And I thought it was kind of fun to see that in the background mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of moving parts going on in here at any given time. Really, there's mm -hmm. a lot of equipment and, and such. Like this is the equipment side of the room and this is kind of the plant side of the room. It's been so wonderful. I can't even... I don't, how did we how did we, we function without this room? We our butts off. Do That's you remember true. in years past we would sit in the front sun porch? Yeah. And we would just sit there with coats and. <laughs> That's true. 
we were made out of tougher stuff earlier yeah. on. <laughs> we're getting soft. Uh, Pamela said, back in the 70s, my mom joined a houseplant club. They sent her a file box that looks like a greenhouse, and every month she was sent 10 or so cards. Each one was for a different plant. They contained so much info. My mom passed this down to me. There were two boxes. I was having problems with my African violet, pulled out the card, and what do you know? The card said that these plants do not like cold water. So now I water them with warm water and have beautiful plants. I now have three plants because the original plant grew so big. I don't know if this is new info to a lot of people, but it sure was for me. All those kinds of tips and tricks that you guys have learned and that you share with us in the comment section are so incredibly helpful. Uh, you, there's a wealth of knowledge, down, mm -hmm. like experience knowledge. Like this is what I have found to be like to make me very successful in this area. So if we can like people like me can read those and be like, oh, maybe I should adjust mm -hmm. and try something different. Maybe I'll have better luck. I think that's awesome. So please, everybody keep commenting what works well for you and what, how you've ha found success because I feel like we all benefit from that. Donna said, do you ever feel that the older part of your home is haunted? <laughs> There's so many room ghosts could have a heyday. I know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't hold with those sorts of beliefs. Uh, Planitude said, I've always heard that African violets need to be bottom watered. Is this true? Something about the leaves rotting if water gets on them. Yes, they do prefer bottom water. In fact, in fact there are specific African violet pots, which I should invest in some, but they're um, kind of glazed on the outside. So they're watertight, but they are um, like there's an insert that goes down in a water reservoir that's terracotta that soaks in water. So you can put water in the reservoir and stick that pot down in the reservoir, kind of like a self-watering pot, but it bottom waters your violets. You can top water, I do. You have to just be really careful not to get any water on the leaves because it does make you get water spots on them one. And then if you get too much water on them, it can make the leaves start to like mush up and it's not a good, not a good thing. Uh, Sarah said, is there a reason you don't pre, you didn't pre-moisten the potting soil for the African violet leaves? You know, I was kind of thinking about that afterward. It would have made it a little easier. Just even lightly pre-moistening it, I probably wouldn't have even had to top water um, that day because I have had to water one other time just a little bit because they did dry out pretty quick. So that's something to do going forward probably. Linda said, your house is gorgeous, Laura. Thank you. Love the built-ins. Are they original to the house or did you have them made? Uh, these things I showed in this video were all there original to the house. Kelsey said, do you think on the African violets, if you cut the stalk, could you put the already rooted part in the soil and get a new plant? You know, if you left a stump, you might. I mean, it, you wouldn't be out anything to give it a try. It works that way with succulents. You know, oftentimes you'll be, it's called beheading. You'll behead your succulent, your, your echeveria. You'll reroot the top and then you're left with this like little stump with roots. A lot of times if you just keep watering it normally, it'll pr uh, produce a lot of babies all around that stalk. Anna said, Laura, when you propagate something, how long do you have to wait before you fertilize it? You know, I wait until I see some pretty good new growth going. I let it really settle into its spot. And then I usually use like a half strength fertilizer on those things, on the, the newly rooted ones, and then kind of work my way up from there. And it, it just depends on what kind of plant you're propagating. Um, like with the African violets, it'll take months for them to root in and start producing new leaves. When I start seeing like more than like a little tiny rosette, I will probably do half strength fertilizer at that point. So in this case, it could be months down the road that I'll have to, I won't have to think about it till then. Next video was brand new perennials in 2022. So we had gone through all of the new annuals for this next year uh, that Proven Winners is bringing out. And then this one was uh, all the new perennials. And there were, do you remember how many there were? 22? In the high 20s. I don't know, a lot, and a lot of exciting ones. Uh, Christy said, uh, Laura, you bring sunshine, warmth, warmth, and hope on these coldest winter days. Seeing all of these beautiful new perennials and hearing you share your passion makes me so excited for spring. I am making my list of must-haves for this planting season. Bless you for sharing your light and love with us. Super encouraging. Thank you, Christy. Darlene said, I have a question about my lilac bush. It's been in my yard two years, planted in part sun. It's too close to my house. I want to move it out before, um, I want to move it out about three feet in the spring. I'm in Philly. Do I prune it before I move it? If so, how much should I cut off? Do I put plantone in it with, in with it in spring? Okay, so what I would do with a lilac, it depends on how much growth. Now, if you prune it back, um, you will forfeit blooms this year. If you're gonna be moving it though, you might wanna go ahead and forfeit blooms anyway so that the plant is focused on rooting in rather than producing flowers and um, maybe producing as many leaves on top. So, you know, 
and again, I think it depends on how big it is. There are some things that I've had in the ground two years that I wouldn't mess with, with cutting back. I would just move them and put biotone sort of fertilizer in the hole, keep them really well watered, and usually they're okay. If it's something that's put on enormous growth, I would think a cutback might be a good idea, but just don't expect blooms on it right away. I did that before with a lilac in our townhouse, Erin, and I'm not sure if it's still there. I put a lilac like two feet away from the corner of our house. Oh, my goodness. And you know, all those things are great if you wanna keep them pruned away, which I was willing to do when I was planting those things. I knew the width of a lilac. Yeah. I knew the potential of what it could do, but I didn't care because I thought, well, we'll just be here forever and I'll just prune on this thing and it's fine. <sighs> Poor Trina <Yeah. laughs> is taking care of that garden now. It's her garden and she says she loves it, thankfully. Grit City Stitch Jen said, for the daisies you spoke about, do they stink? We had daisies in our front yard a few years ago and they smelled horrible. I know that smell and they do not have that smell to my knowledge. I have not smelled it on those daisies I talked about. And I had them up on a table in the greenhouse, which intensifies the warmth. And when you intensify warmth, a lot of times it intensifies smells. And I never noticed it when they were in bloom. Dorota said, my Monarda had mildew last summer. Are these mildew resistant? Yes, the newer versions are more mildew resistant than the older resistant than the older versions but even like with the flocks that I talked about that are way more resistant to mildew um, it's best with those sorts of plants if they're more prone to it uh, just to make sure there's really good airflow around your plants don't put them in a really crowded flower bed or crowd them too close together uh, because even resistant ones if you live in a really humid wet climate you might still deal with a little bit of that so just give them the space that they need but yes they are more resistant to it Rhea said I planted some hardy hibiscus last year and need to move them can I move them this spring or do I, do I need to wait to move till the fall I would move them early this spring and let them break door they're really slow to break dormancy so I think getting them moved early in the spring they'll have plenty of time just to sit there and chill and then they can um, grow again they're pretty tough plants Ralph said have you ever thought of you and your mother having a special area in your garden that you two worked on together I've not really thought about it we both have so many projects going on mm -hmm. I don't know how we would do that like we talk about our gardens all the time and like bounce ideas off of each other. I know my mom and I have been talking about the bed that lines their swimming pool. Mm -hmm. We've been talking through different options of what she could do in that bed. And so we'll go, go through stuff like that all the time. I, you know, I think with your guys' relationship, it, it doesn't make sense to have like a... It seems like you would do that if you, ha if you had more of a distant relationship with your mom. But you guys work in each other's, like you guys help each other out anyway. Yeah. Just kind of all over in general. Yeah. So like Our lives a, are just like. Yeah, they're kind of really intertwined anyway. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just having a specific place, a specific like part of the garden, I, I just can't see that. It wouldn't really make sense mm -hmm. for your guys' relationship. Yeah. We're all up in each other's business all the time. Yeah. <laughs> in all things. So. Yeah. Uh, Jordan said, do you guys know why some plants go through a name change? Uh, a lot of times like if it changes, if it's been bred to be better, because I know a lot of older varieties are bred to be a better version of that older variety. And sometimes they'll keep the same, like banana cream daisy, it's now banana cream two, mm -hmm. or it's supertunia priscilla improved. Um, so it still maintains that same name, but there's a little bit of a change to it so that you know it's the better one, the one that has a better growth habit and so on and so forth. Sometimes they'll change a name if they change hands too, mm -hmm. like whoever owns the genetics sometimes a name will change will occur when mm -hmm. that happens and I'm not sure why exactly just well, a rebrand maybe a rebrand yeah. mm -hmm. there could be like rights to the name but not to the it's that complicated plant. Yeah. it's like really kind of squirrely the plant world in a way yeah it's interesting because there's there's new plants that come out and uh -huh. there's also old plants that re come out right you know what I mean uh -huh. so uh, Marie said, can you help out those of us inundated with deer? I'm forced to pick up all my perennials from the deer tolerance section. Can you provide any new perennial suggestions? You know, we don't have any deer here that bother our garden, so I don't have any firsthand knowledge on what plants truly thrive in a deer riddled area. I would check out Erin in Patient Gardener's channel. Uh, she has deer in her area. She lives in Wisconsin, right Erin? Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and she's, yeah. So she's got some really good suggestions. I know she's created like a fenced in area too for like raised beds. And um, so I think she would be a much more wealth of knowledge in that department than I am for sure. Next video. And I think the last one for this week was very successful antique shopping day with my mom. So my mom and I took 
our, an opportunity we had. We were both free on a day and we went over to Boise. We went to several different shops. It was successful. Like our truck was packed full, like full of stuff. And you know, sometimes we'll get, I mean, you guys know, we have a antique shopping day where we have just a handful of things or just one or two things. And sometimes we end up with like lots of furniture. We wish we would have had a trailer <laughs> to hook up to the truck, all those things. So Mary KB said, did anyone else exclaim yes when they saw that Laura and her mom were antiquing? They always bring me so much joy as do all of your videos and laughter. Thank you for bringing us along on your shopping adventures with your mom. You know, I think that based on what I'm reading in the comment section, I, you know, antiquing, when we very first did our very first antiquing video, it was kind of like, oh, this is a little off topic. I hope you guys like it. But I think it has resonated with so many of you guys in terms of like reminding you of your relationship with your mom. And um, for those of you who have moms that have passed, you have enjoyed watching us go and shop. And I love reading your comments where you feel like those warm feelings again. I don't know. Um, so I'm glad you guys have enjoyed those videos because I enjoy it a lot. I told Aaron in the car yesterday we were driving and I said, you know what? My mom and I should, we should uh, t attach a tra trailer to the truck and we should do like a, a trip to the coast and like doing taking along the coast. Wouldn't yeah. that be fun? Like go hit some new shops that we've never been to because when we go, we are limited. You know, we don't have, we have good shops over there, but we go to the same ones every time. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that doesn't get too old. I mean, it's different every time we go cause they have different stuff for the most part, but, um, just to change it up, that'd be kind of fun, like an overnight yeah. trip somewhere. Shine and Shimmer said, I could never figure out if the price at my antique store is right or overpriced. How do you know if something is a good price? Just curious to know. You know, I have focused so much on just picking up items that speak to me that I really love. Uh, and I think the more that you go, the more you go, the more you'll see different items and you can kind of compare shops. Uh, and you start to realize, I think, like, if something might be a little bit overpriced. I mean, I waited, I have a mirror in our house um, that was, I can't remember what it was marked, like $500. There was no way I was gonna spend $500 on a mirror. I rated, waited like three years, I think, and that mirror was still there. Wow. And so you can haggle. I don't haggle that often on prices um, unless I know like, I should be getting this for less money than they have it marked at. Like they priced that too high. And I think I ended up getting it for 300, which is still a lot for a mirror, but this mirror, you guys, is amazing. It's from France, it's gorgeous. And I You've felt- been thinking about something for three years. For three years, I looked at it every time and I just thought, oh, I'd love to have that in my house. And I ended up getting it for almost half off, close. Uh, so I felt good about that purchase. And that's a thing too. A lot of times, like the chairs I bought on this trip, I saw when Aaron and I went, and looked at that store earlier this month and they were way too out of my budget and out of like, and they were already 50% off and still like, and so uh, my sister-in-law who loves that store, she said, I think they've reduced their prices even more like 50% off what it was marked. And so I thought, well, we'll go if the chairs are still there. And if they are 50% off their 50% off price, then I'll do it. And they were, and they were there and it was amazing. So I, I feel, I don't know. In terms of knowing what is a good price, I don't know antiques. Like I am not an antique connoisseur. There are people out there who that's like their their thing, their job, and they would know what things should be priced at. I don't. <laughs> I think you just kind of know your threshold. You know what you want to look for or you want for your own home. And sometimes you might pay over the price because it's worth it to you. And sometimes you find really good deals. Super unhelpful answer. <laughs> Monica said, when you're on these trips, can you try to say the price is more? That's a little bit of a hard one because I just, I don't really want the comment section to become about, cause like on trips like this, obviously I spent more money than on previous trips. And sometimes it happens that way. And I don't really want that to become the topic of conversation in the comments. I want it to be more about like the beauty of the items. And I don't do that all of the time. Um, but I know that that kind of is the nature of how things go. And if you start talking about prices and people start adding things up, I just don't want that to be a focus ever. And we don't really focus on price often just because areas are so different. Like we don't talk about plant prices, what we pay for things even at other garden centers because like the pricing between my parents' garden center here in Ontario um, versus, you know, 60 minutes down the road in Boise, the prices are way different. Like the price on a David Austin Rose is almost half here in Ontario as opposed to what you would pay in Boise. So the demographic can be so different and pricing can be so different. And really uh, shops within the same area too. If you go to a shop, you can tell like a little bit more upscale. Mm -hmm. They'll just price their stuff higher than something. You can get the same thing somewhere else. It's less, I don't know. 
That's not well, right. you know, I, I don't know. If you have a place where it's like an experience, yeah. you go somewhere for an experience. Yeah. You know, you go to Disneyland and you're definitely there for an experience mm-hmm. and you pay like, I don't know, 10 bucks for a hamburger or something. Maybe it's mm-hmm. more. Right. Crystal said, love your channel. Question for your weekly recap. On the videos with your mom, does she get editing options for herself when you finalize a video? Um, I've offered that to her. I've offered to, like, before we upload it, I could send her a version of it and she could watch it first. But she really isn't concerned with that. I think she trusts that we wouldn't put something out there that she didn't like. And I review every video one time before it goes out. So, you know, Ken edits it. Um, he brings it to us. And then I review it typically first. And then I I'd make adjustments. Like in this one, I actually cut quite a bit. Not quite a bit. Maybe, like, I cut maybe two minutes or so out of there just because I feel like it maybe lingered too, like, I was walking behind my mom and I lingered too long on my mom or something like that. And I felt like it made the video lag just a tiny bit. And it might be like a five second cut, Mm -hmm. but I'll go through and, and do that. And I think she trusts that. I don't think she's ever been like upset with the way it came out. Yeah. Yeah. We had to do a lot of cuts after the fact on, um, on that video. Yeah. You kept getting copyright mm -hmm. claims. So I would upload the video and then it has to process for a minute and then it'll say, you know, the song was playing in the background. And what it was is just at these shops, the songs that were playing on the radio. Uh, so I had to mute a bunch of sections. It happened like three or four times. And it's like the way that YouTube works, it can only find one song at a time. So you upload the video and it'll say, you know, oh, we caught you, you know, adding Jason Derulo in your mm-hmm. video. So I edit that part out and re-upload it. And then it finds a different clip. Instead of mm-hmm. telling me all the spots that had music in it. Right. That's frustrating. And you did that three or four times the night before because mm-hmm. we get everything ready and schedule it the night before. And then you had to get up at like 5.30 in the morning because we got another one. Yeah. And you had to fix that right. so that it could continue on anyway. That doesn't happen all the time. No, it's pretty rare. R.C. Miller said, my first time on your channel, who is Monica? Monica is my little sister. Um, so she and I went antiquing for my mom for Christmas. And so she, that was the first time she was really like in a video for a long time. She lived in Washington and like Northern Idaho and Washington for the time we've been doing YouTube videos. And so she's only home for a short amount of times and we haven't had a chance to do a lot. She was going, she was trying to work it out to where she could come on this antiquing trip, but she and her husband were going to like getting ready to take a vacation. And she's like, I'm taking a lot of vacation time for this, maybe on the next one. So um, she will probably be joining us. Uh, Karen said, I love watching you in your mom antique shop. I can't wait to see you plant the dress form. What did you wind up giving your mom for Christmas? I don't think I ever let anybody know. So I mm. ended up getting, giving her the brown transfer wear platter. Um, I gave her a, a White House ornament. So she has a White House, she has a president's room. Their dining room is the president's room and it's all black and white pictures of presidents. And um, she's got a, her Christmas tree in there. She does like the official White House ornaments. And so she has some years she didn't have yet. So each one of us kids ordered her a White House ornament. And then I gave her the beautiful chandelier lamp with the black marble base. And I knew like I wanted to keep it so bad, (laughs) but I knew she would love it. So, and she did. And it's in their entryway. She got little black shades for it and it's beautiful. Amber said, Laura, you should write a book. There are so many topics she could do, but I would be head over heels for hosting in the Hartley book. Could you imagine the beautiful flowers and seasonal crafts she could include? She could even add in a section of her cocktails and appetizers. You know, that has been a discussion for years, years because we have publishers come to us and um, ask if we want to do something. I just don't know. I, I don't know. We have so much going on. You know, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. And we don't have like massive staff. Uh, if we had like somebody else, I think maybe to help with projects like that. It's just that I can't, I don't want to, um, what is it? Commit more time to any mm-hmm. other projects because like my project, my main project is my kids mm-hmm. and, um, and you know, making videos. So that's like all I kind of want to do. In I think <laughs> write, you know, writing a book is such an unknown for you. And yeah. I, I don't think that you've really fancied yourself a writer. No. And so you would have to rely a lot on a, um, what do you call the person that kind of like helps you? Not an editor, like a, but like well, publishers will assign a person to help you write sure. the book. Uh-huh. And like you, you send them what you've written and then they'll tell you like, you might consider. I have this red around. marks yeah. all over my page. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, I think it's just such an unknown for you. It's like, I don't know how much time it would take. Yeah. And so, like, are we going to post half as many videos if we do a book? And is that worth it? 
You know, is that what really what you want to be doing? I don't know. Because our videos are really just an extension of what you're actually doing in the garden. Yeah. So if you do less videos, what it actually means is that you're just doing less of what you right. what you know you like to do. And I would never sell it. Like, I think that's right. the thing. I'm not, I couldn't self-promote like that. Yeah. I, I don't like that. I don't like it when, I don't want to turn into, have our stuff turn into that. Right. Where um, all you're doing is like, today's video, I'm at a book signing and yeah, such and I just, such Barnes and Noble. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, never say never. We've attempted a calendar. <laughs> I haven't really got it like nailed down yet. And maybe we'll do a calendar at some point. I mean, you guys know our merch is pretty sad. Like it's pretty basic. We haven't expanded anything because it takes a lot of research and man hours and, and such. Sunshine Mystic Moon said, what type of truck do you have? Love the ladder on the back. Looks very roomy too. So glad you found so many treasures. That is a Ford truck and that is a like an add-on. Um, you can get a tailgate that has a built-in stair. Like our other one, our gray truck doesn't have it. I wish it did. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that thing has been so nice. So the, the stair comes out and like pops down and then there's a handle that slides out and then it expands. And so you can grab onto the handle like lift yourself up into the back of the truck and they're not super tall trucks but tall enough like I, you, yeah i think that every truck should have that as a yeah, standard option i do too because getting up into trucks is not it's not good i mean i jumped up in, into trucks for a lot of years and i don't really think that's good for a person to be doing yeah. over and over and over again not good on your knees it's not or good jumping on, down off of them yeah too. and i've done that a lot too um uh, yeah, it's so nice. And that, so it's a Ford F-150, like 2015 maybe? Yeah. yeah, so it's a few years old. And it's kind of our work truck. It's got a little bit of a bigger bed than our gray truck, so we can fit a little bit more. So that's the one we usually take antiquing. <laughs> uh, Melissa said, I'm, uh, yep, I'm all in for that. Show us where your lovely pieces will go. Uh, question, I know you and Aaron are planning on doing a home makeover. Is this why you are waiting on, uh, is this what you are waiting on to do Samantha Grace's room and the new makeover rooms be done? Uh, in the new makeover, will the rooms be done? So the new home makeover, we're kind of in like beginning stages. We have a contractor we're working with and an architect, but I think we're a couple of years out because what we're gonna do, we're gonna actually have to move out of our house for probably. And so we're gonna have to figure out what, what we wanna do and how intense of a remodel we actually wanna do in the end. So uh, it'll be interesting once the architect is gonna come back out once there's no snow on the ground so he can get measurements of everything outside and inside. And I'm really looking forward to working with somebody that's got that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes, we really try like to try to to take our house a little bit more colonial than farmhouse and marry the old side with the new side in in a way that's cohesive that you like and that I like and um, yeah I think we're gonna have to just go ahead and start making the kids rooms like just kind of carry on because who knows how many years down the road that will be that'll even happen and who knows how intense we'll even do it you I know wonder if that's uh, if that's just a thing that most people come across in old homes where they're trying to decide like at what point do we remodel this you know the either one room at a time or multiple see yeah that's the thing because what our renovation will include is that we still have like knob and tube like nothing's grounded the wire on the old side of the house which is not safe and so we need to have wiring re redone and we need to have all the plumbing redone because it's starting to spring leaks everywhere uh, not everywhere but you know in enough places to where we have patches in our ceiling uh, and so we just I think we're just gonna like tear down the walls and redo all of that interior stuff which will give us the ability to move some windows around and um, like redo we want all smooth walls with no texture and we want to do new floors and anybody big that we've moldings. had out to look at the house though they look at from the outside looking at it and they kind of they go you have four different pitches of your roof on the new side there's two different ones and on the old side like we're like yes we know <laughs> and they're like everybody looks at it, they're like what am i going to do to fix that cuz it's like whoever whoever did it just kind of just did whatever they wanted mm -hmm. whatever really worked at the time need, yeah it didn't really need to make a whole lot of sense uh -huh. it's a pretty home i think there's a lot of potential yeah. one of the things that i've thought about is like maybe what we should do is just try to hide the house with trees <laughs> we <should> just <laughs> evergreens and never lose their leaves <laughs> Cause, yeah because you look at it and from certain angles it can look pretty but there's also so many things that are like structurally like i'm not sure about like the columns um yeah they're not round but are they they're, well they're they're metal underneath it's just a well, we square we don't know what they are underneath well, we've been told I've they're heard. probably metal <laughs> underneath yeah but we don't know without taking off so with the columns though they're leaning yeah and 
and things like that. So what I'm saying is like you look at the house, you're like, oh, that's really pretty. But you start to get close at it and yeah. you're like, is that okay? Like, should like, that lean? <laughs> like, can can I get up on the balcony yeah. or will it come down? Yeah. You know, things like, and the balcony holds water. Mm-hmm. There's just a spot. lot of things that don't, they look okay if you're just looking from a distance. Right. But when you get up close, it's like, no, that's uh, that's actually not right. Yeah, those shutters are overlapping. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. why? Oh, And it's geez. tough because, you know... Like, we're blessed with such a big house, and yeah. it's nice. You don't want to complain about it. No. You know? Well, and that's why, like, it's totally fine, and maybe we should start, like, doing up the kids' rooms either way, because who knows? We may not even... We may decide not to take it as extreme as we're thinking. You know, you always go in with these lofty ideas, right. and then we'll be we'll be brought down to reality, I'm yeah. sure, pretty quick once we start talking with the architect, but we can start at the dream phase. There's uh, nothing wrong with that. I think you and I... Our personality is just to kind of shoot for the stars, which sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. And I think we'll be okay either way, whatever. Yeah, we'll whatever bring happens. you guys along for whatever ends up happening. I mean, it won't change into a home renovation channel, don't worry. Um, if we decide to do any kind of videos or whatever, we'll probably throw them on this channel, on the Highlight channel. I think it would be a total waste if we didn't film the before and after. Oh, yeah. Like, we need to just take lots of video and yeah. lots of photos of what it looked like before mm-hmm. and then after. Mm-hmm. And then we can create... I was thinking we could create, like, little videos of each space uh-huh. um, that gets remodeled. And kind of put them together in the end. That would yeah. be really fun. I don't even know where I'm at. Oh, Phoebe said, was anyone able to catch what the lady in the first antique store said as they walked in? So she said, just to let you guys know, we're actually closed to the public. And I was like, oh, your door was unlocked. (laughs) So, I mean, we just walked in like, hey, we're here. And she said, but you guys can, you know, we're here right now because we've got some people picking some stuff up. And so you guys can shop. Lucky. Which made it like another like nail in the, yeah. It made me feel like those chairs are meant to be because this door isn't even open for business anymore and they're letting us shop and those chairs are still there. Taking Up said, do you recall the color or brand of paint on the walls of your soon-to-be dining room? That is Sherwin-Williams Black Fox. And the one in the great room is Sherwin-Williams Thunder Gray. I get asked those questions a lot about those colors. They're amazing colors. I like I like um, dark dark colors a lot. I like cozy rooms and the rooms like the great room is so large that it can pull off a really dark color. But that black fox, it's like a super dark brown uh, in the soon to be dining room. That made it feel like a really cozy little den area. And then the kitchen's light. So I kind of try to do like dark room, light room, dark room, light room so that it's not all too dark. I don't have a method, but that's just kind of how it's ended up. Uh, Dixie Wonderland said, what's up with all the chairs, Laura? It's like you take a shot every time Laura sees a chair that she likes. True. It's because I don't like sharing, sharing seating with other people. Like, I don't mind. I think it's because I'm a middle child. And so every time we had to go on a car ride, I'm always in the middle. I, that every make time we sense sit anywhere, I have to sit so... in the middle. Uh, like agreeable to sit in the middle instead of making Monica sit in the middle because she was like smaller than you were. Oh, well, just, I don't know. Like, how did she get the side? I don't know. I think I... It's just because I'm so nice. Yeah, you're. you're <laughs> no, I, I like having I like being in my own chair. I like to have like an area to put my drink next to me, and mm. I like to just not be like up against somebody else. So couches are okay as long as nobody's sitting in the center. Like you and I were working this morning on our computers at two ends of the couch. Right. I can do. I could sit next to you. You're no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's just when I always have to sit in the middle of chairs. I don't know. I just like chairs. And they're easy to, to fit in places. It's like when you go uh, shopping for clothes, you just gravitate toward the coats. Yeah. Oh, this is a pretty coat. Look at this. Coats and sweaters. Yeah. And, yeah. Cozy things. Um, and Elsa said, no mirror. So I did see that comment quite a bit because we saw in that first shop that perfect little mirror. Uh, it had like the little swag, like a garland up above it for Samantha Grace's room. And I completely forgot about it. And now I don't think I can go get it. Um, we just, we were looking at so many things. And by the end, I think I was in such a lather, like we got so excited about those chairs and the other little things that I got that I just had completely spaced that mirror. It would have been perfect. So hopefully I'll come across one that looks like that again someday. And that is it for this week. That's it for this recap. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you're having a great start to your week and we will see you in the next video. Bye.